very hard to get him. It's pure name against the law, but um, I like some water. <laughs> Addicted as it is. The topic of tonight's discussion is the psychedelic marriage. Gulp. <laughs> or subtitled, How to Tune In. For those of you who were not here two nights ago, or for those of you that were here and could not follow my circular and helical reasoning, <laughs> I, I, I think I should review briefly what was discussed last night. Um, two nights ago, uh, we discussed psychedelic psychology, which is the um, study of pleasure which is the study of the unconditioned state and the relationship of the pleasurable or unconditioned state to the conditioned or uptight state. Now, I define pleasure as the uh, nervous system freed from the rewards and punishments and associations of uh, social conditioning. And uh, I spoke about the hedonic age, which is now well upon us and blossoming in our future, the age of play and display, in which the only point of human life will be the uh, seeking of what we're here to find, uh, the state of radiant, loving bliss. Now, the discussion last uh, time became rather scientific and psychological and classificatory. Uh, I talked about the hedonic index and suggested that at every second of our life, uh, we are at one hedonic level or another. Uh, the aim of the game, of course, being to control your hedonic machinery and to be able to move uh, up and down at will. Uh, I suggested that there were seven uh, broad classifications of uh, of consciousness, uh, three of which uh, are uh, subject to social conditioning, that is sleep, emotion, and uh, mentation or social thinking. And then I spoke about what you might call, uh, I don't have my blackboard here, so I have to do this um, uh, with the vibratory blackboard. Uh, I suggested that there were four levels of consciousness um, which uh, were unconditioned, the sensory, the somatic, the genetic, and the uh, highest of all, which I call the um, electro electrobiochemical. And I talked about the, um, the hedonic barrier. There is a hedonic barrier. <laughs> uh, m most of our society is uh, trained and conditioned to live at the level of um, emotion. Turned on, all right. Uh, this is your hedonic index. <laughs> See, it makes you feel better already, doesn't it? <laughs> the, the hedonic barrier uh, is this line between social conditioning and then uh, the, the breakthrough into sensory, somatic, or uh, genetic uh, consciousness. <clears throat> I. Uh, also mentioned last week that all of these states of consciousness uh, are uh, brought about by internal biochemistry and that these uh, levels of consciousness are based not upon uh, my visions of hell and purgatory and heaven or uh, the seven levels of the Tibetan uh, trip. Uh, we have based our definitions of the level of pleasure or the level of consciousness on organs of the body and biochemical systems within the body and you move from level to level uh, as a result of uh, biochemical conversations within your body, which are either natural, in the case of uh, sleep, fatigue uh, builds up um, the internal biochemicals, which uh, cause you to nod out, and so forth. I also suggested that each of these levels of consciousness can be attained uh, by the use of an exogenous agent, that is a chemical or a drug, 
and there are specific drugs which can get you to these different levels of consciousness or bring you down. Uh, narcotic drugs, of course, put you to sleep. Uh, the drugs which stir up emotions, uh, the best and most popular of which in this country is alcohol. Um, for level three, um, if you want to speed up your uh, social uh, conditioning, reward and punishment systems, uh, uh, methadrine is the drug of choice. Or uh, coffee in the morning can, can help the more cautious. Uh, level four, uh, the obvious agent of choice is uh, marijuana, turns on your senses. Uh, level three, uh, stronger uh, psychedelics, perhaps hashish or similar substances. And for level two and level one, the stronger psychedelics. Now, uh, <laughs> our light show team is really working. Um, I, I spoke with uh, some uh, dismay about the great problem of our time, uh, both intrapsychic or interpersonal, social and political, which is the hedonic gap. As a matter of fact, that's the general title of these five lectures, um, how to identify the hedonic gap and how to reduce it. The, uh, the uh, obvious fact is that anyone you meet at any second in your life is either higher than you, or uh, you're higher than him. <laughs> and the result of the interaction, of course, uh, is uh, going to depend upon who's higher and who can bring who up or down. Um, <laughs> there's another ominous but also promising fact that every second of uh, your life or my life, we are either getting higher <laughs> or we're coming down. Um, and the, uh, the science of hedonic engineering <laughs> is that practical application of hedonic theory <laughs> which allows you to control the uh, movement up and down and to, uh, in particular, to reduce uh, the ominous consequences of severe hedonic gaps between you and other people. <laughs> then, uh, as part of hedonic engineering, I suggested that there are at least uh, 21 yogas or 21 ways of getting high or 21 ways of turning on or 21 ways of deconditioning yourself from the rewards and punishments of the rat maze. And I listed these very quickly. Um, the, um, the, uh, this included meditation and fasting and diet and sensory yogas and rituals and uh, uh, the yoga of power and submission and uh, so forth. The two uh, greatest yogas, uh, number 20 and 21 on my, on my list, um, the, uh, the yoga of spiritual sex, and then finally the yoga of drugs, which I consider to be the maha yoga, because uh, your body uh, is the uh, system from which uh, all these spiritual events emanate. Your body is a biochemical uh, uh, instrument, and therefore the direct language of your body are drugs, and in the future uh, we're going to have to learn how to, uh, to use these uh, possibilities with exquisite precision. And uh, if you're going to use drugs, you uh, had better learn something about the 20 other yogas, uh, and uh, because uh, drugs can release all the energies that are released one at a time or separately by the other yogas. Uh, in other words, um, <laughs> what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, uh, to quote uh, that great group of local prophets, Big Brother and the Holding Company, um, sex, dope, and other cheap thrills. Or I changed the word cheap, I would say free. Now, <laughs> now uh, that's called uh, a, a, that hedonic gap is um, not interlevel but uh, within one level. Uh, that's what we're working on it. <laughs> I want to repeat a warning uh, which I made uh, uh, last week, and that is that uh, you know well that there's no dogmatic uh, stuff being laid out tonight. This is just uh, our trip, uh, Rosemary and mine and our brothers and sisters, and uh, we're not explaining, we're exploring, uh, we're sharing some of the uh, uh, notions that have occurred to us. <laughs> I really have to repeat 
this morning, uh, you know, an underscore tonight when I'm talking about something that is um, uh, elusive as the sexual relationship, uh, particularly speaking from the male point of view, uh, so that all of the warnings must be redoubled. Um, in addition to the fact that I'm a Libra, and you know, you know what Libras like to do. <laughs> Now, the main point I'm trying to make tonight uh, as I talk about the psychedelic marriage is this, that the use of psychedelic drugs uh, push you uh, through the hedonic uh, barrier, and they basically turn on your body. Uh, psychedelic drugs turn on uh, somatic and sensory and genetic energies. Uh, therefore, if you're going to use psychedelic drugs, particularly strong psychedelic drugs, level uh, 3 and level 2 and level 1 drugs, such as LSD and mescaline, uh, it seems to me that um, you're going to have to work out a um, system of tantric worship. That is, you're going to have to harness these physical energies uh, in union with a member of the opposite sex. Now, this does not mean that uh, everyone's got to do that. As a matter of fact, I would be so bold as to say that perhaps there are 50% of the people on this planet and 50% of the people in this room who probably uh, uh, are not karmically disposed to this particular yoga, the yoga of turning on the energies in your body and then uh, learning how to hook these up in uh, uh, helical union. Um, Side of drugs... Uh, do turn on erotic energy. Now, what do I mean by erotic? Uh, eros, love. Uh, they turn on uh, the physical lovemaking equipment, not just genital, but uh, cellular and sensory. Uh, to us, uh, eros means God. God, love, eros. God, love, eros. Uh, religion means eros, love. To put it uh, in the words of Playboy magazine, uh, psychedelic drugs are aphrodisiacs. <laughs> now, when this first uh, came out in that scientific publication, the statement came out several years ago, um, many of the leading uh, psychedelic scientists uh, rose up in alarm and outrage and said, that's an absolute lie. Uh, there was a very famous uh, psychedelic researcher in the East who had written a book, as a matter of fact, on psychedelic experience and had given psychedelic drugs to uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. And, and she said, uh, I have witnessed over 500 ingestions of psychedelic experiences and uh, there was not one uh, erotic experience <laughs> in my presence. <laughs> not to mention all the psychiatrists who had given LSD in mental hospitals. <laughs> they, they had... Uh, Absolute proof that uh, LSD was not uh, an erotic instrument. Um, by uh, aphrodisiac, of course, in the Playboy interview, I, I simply meant uh, Aphrodite, love. Uh, the effect of side of drugs is to uh, turn on your love uh, energies, not necessarily and automatically for good, because if there's anything that is ominous and uh, destructive and uh, really uh, fearful in human existence, it's powerful erotic energies which are distorted or twisted or not understood or able to be channeled and tuned in. Uh, most of our aggression, of course, obviously comes from that. So <laughs> that uh, I'm simply pointing out that uh, psychedelic drugs do pose the problem of erotic love, turning it on or turning it off. Of course, the, uh, the Playboy interview was, was um, a rather interesting experience anyway. Um, Playboy magazine sent a reporter up to Millbrook now, if it had been Sports Illustrated, uh, I would have given them the, the athletic trip. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Larry, do you think that Mickey Mantle would hit more home runs on grass? And I would have pointed out, well, it depends upon which sport you want to play, that there are certain sports that psychedelic drugs will help. Any sport which involves immediacy, and which involves uh, sensory intensification and flowing in harmony, uh, yeah, probably um, the United States ski team, <laughs> certainly the United States surfing team, <laughs> possibly the tennis team, um, uh, would benefit uh, the um, pro football. Uh. <laughs> so, great. 
Chris, in a sense, the the uh, the uh, Playboy interview was I would call it a put on, but I was simply attempting to uh, to uh, stimulate uh, the imaginations of that particular audience. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the interviewer kept saying to me, "Well, now take the case of a 38-year-old man who's been married for 10 years. What can I do for him and his?" All right. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, I remember I was uh, giving a lecture in Portland, Oregon, uh, a couple of years ago, and, and uh, I was invited after one lecture to come over to Reed College just for an informal get-together, and when I got there, uh, they had one of their rooms that had about 500 people uh, who were all obviously very high, and they had uh, candles going. It was just like an informal get-together, and they had Indian music, and I walked in, and I just, we talked back and forth, and it was all very uh, pleasant. <laughs> Towards the end, a young man in the back row with glittering glasses got up, and he said that uh, he was a uh, biologist or something, and uh, he wanted to check out scientific status of some of my facts. And he had read that I had said in Playboy magazine that a woman can have up to 200 orgasms. And he wanted to know, like, what it was the uh, quantitative statistical nature of this data. <laughs> uh, I, I can't. Well, the well, first place, I mean, uh, I just learned it from, from uh, my informants. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so there's that bias to begin with. And I kind of fell back uh, on the uh, podium there, a bunch of cushions, and there was a girl, a Reed College girl, sitting there. And I said to her, "What shall I tell him?" And she said, <laughs> "Tell him, yeah, 200, and they're purple." <laughs> <laughs> Where are the lights? <laughs>
uh, we had her a case of breaking through the hedonic barrier. Uh, and the question is, uh, how can you, uh, what sort of rhythm do you want to keep going? Because once you, uh, once you have broken through the hedonic barrier, once you are aware of the fact that there's more beside reward and punishment and uh, dull pain, uh, then the question is, uh, how much sensory and which sensory and how much somatic and which somatic? And uh, then the, the, uh, the real excitement and challenge of psychedelic psychology or the spiritual life begins to unfold. Then which yogas, which techniques, when and how, and basically, with whom? <laughs> with whom? Now, um, you see, when a culture uh, gets over-conditioned and drifts along uh, this low level, uh, as I suggested, uh, then you get religions of pain and suffering. See, uh, if you get a whole nation which is just kind of drifting along at the level of uh, reward, pain, and uh, minor irritation, uh, you've got to have a value system that backs that up so that most of our uh, Western uh, value systems and religions, of course, are, uh, are suffering religions. Uh, they glorify, they glorify the down trip. Uh, in uh, most Judeo-Christian systems, no, really, illness can become, uh, you know, uh, a virtue. Uh, certainly the worried frown uh, will get you to heaven faster than the, uh, the broad grin. <laughs> uh, we even begin to worship illness. You know, uh, uh, I don't, well, Rosemary, I don't watch television very often, but occasionally we are in a motel on the road and we watch television or we look at Life magazine on the plane. It's amazing the number of ads for uh, patent medicines and aspirin and, uh, you know, uh, three-way and two-way this and uh, None of these drugs aim to make you feel good, but just to ease the pain a little. <laughs> As recently, we uh, had some uh, revelatory experiences recently, and I began thinking about um, uh, the illness trip that the world has been on this year. I think that uh, if you were studying this planet from another planet, you would uh, be sending back messages that um, uh, the human race just feels bad this winter. <laughs> you know, that there's in the Hong Kong flu. That came along about in October when people were, November, when people were thinking about electing a president. <laughs> and when you had a third of the electorate, you know, so sick that they just wanted to die, they said, yeah, man, let Nixon have it. I mean, <laughs> he, he seems more, more worried than the other two. <laughs> if you're that sick, you don't want a smiling face around, do you? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Then the Nixon administration gets to Washington, and immediately they come down with the Potomac flu or, or hepatitis. It's pretty virulent in the White House, you know, <laughs> and other spiritual communities. <laughs> and yeah, the cabinet is there, and they're all feeling down, and, you know, we just, there's no zest. And I'm uh, sure Jed Gerber wants another 40-year term. Yeah, let him have it. Sure, pass the aspirin, Pat, you know. Wow. <laughs> um, there's, there's, um, you know... Um, if you study the political bulletins, you'll realize that most of the uh, leaders of the world are operating out of hospital beds. You know, every now and then, every now and then they 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 get uh, Mao to swing up and they prove he's alive. <laughs> and I think it was an it was, it was an ominous precedent in Mr. Nixon's uh, history that uh, you know about nine or ten years ago, perhaps longer. Uh, President Eisenhower had a, a heart attack and he ran the country from that uh, plush uh, hospital in uh, Colorado. And then, uh, well, uh, yeah, it's, uh, um, I think it's a warning that, uh, that the, you know, civilized man, technological man, urban man, is just not taking care of his body and uh, is not in tune with uh, the rhythm of his body and energy exchanges and uh, there's more smog and there's... Uh, uh, more oil pollution, and I predict that if this, you know, if this goes on, there's going to be more and more Hong Kong flu next uh, year, and so forth. Uh, and uh, there'll be, of course, an intensification of the down religion, and then uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, God in a hospital. <laughs> uh, the the down trip around, of course, has something to do with the Book of Genesis, uh, when Adam and Eve got uh, thrown out of the Garden of Eden for uh, eating that fruit. I mean, that is just an unfortunate trip. 
uh, I would like to just uh, scrap that whole business. Uh, if we're going to really move into the Aquarian age, we've got to rewrite Genesis. The, the, this is the early basis without much creativity or change. Uh, um, Eve gives the Adam to Apple. <laughs> All right, I'm getting the Apple, right. <laughs> and he bites it. And he fantastic, where'd you get that? Here, try it. And she tries it. Yeah, incredible. Hey, give some to the snake. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> then they plant the apple seeds, and the next year they have a hundred apple trees, and then they get... Mm. <laughs> well, I think everyone in this room certainly uh, does not belong to the uh, down trip. You can divide perhaps all human beings, or perhaps all, certainly all religions, into down trips or up trips, and I think that perhaps everyone in this room is a seeker or a searcher uh, who wants to get to beyond the conditioned reflexes. Would you like to come in and sit down here? <laughs> so that, uh, now the question becomes simply a matter of the competition. Who's, <laughs> like, whose product is going to get you <laughs> higher, faster, longer, <laughs> cheaper? <laughs> now, we have, uh, you know, um, this, this guru tells you about his ocean of bliss, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> another one uh, has uh, the endless orgasm, <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he had, uh, all these different competitive uh, groups offering their brand of ecstasy. <laughs> I was in Kyoto once uh, on one of my pilgrimages, and I was talking to a Zen master who was also a prof full professor. It <laughs> uh, threw me a little. <laughs> and he said to me, um, you were interested in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. I said, yes. He said, you've written a book about, this, about the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead. I said, yes. Uh, he said, well, um, we in Japan think that uh, our form of Buddhism is purer than that. And I said, well, yeah, right. Uh, why? Take me on your trip. <laughs> he said, well, uh, don't, don't the Tibetans call their white light of the void like a white light? I said, yeah. He said, well, we just talk about pure void. How can the void be white? Right. <laughs> I said, well, Professor, you've taught me a great deal. <laughs> like we had, uh, perhaps tonight or the other night, we had uh, advertising of gurus at the door. They were handing out, you know, advertising bills. About <laughs> I'm in favor of competition, and I welcome the uh, Mayor Babaites and anyone else that wants to uh, come up and talk or pass out uh, literature. Uh, remember, I'm not involved, and Rosemary and our brother are not involved in the guru game at all. Uh, it's just not my karma to, uh, to uh, go along with an uh, avatar, supreme master, perfect illuminated state guru. Uh, I recognize there are such people, and that perhaps for 50% of uh, any uh, group, uh, that's the trip. But... Uh, uh, it's my astrological karma not to take that trip this time. Now, there's no competition here between uh, any of these because we all are going to get to the same place. And we all want to get to the same place. And uh, we know that there are different directions. Oddly enough, we can go in exactly opposite directions and we'll probably end up there uh, at the same time if we follow our karmic, if we follow our genetic, uh, our DNA uh, ticker instructions, which I'm going to talk more about and more specifically later. Now, if uh, any, any guru or any technique can get you to the ocean of bliss at the rate that you want to get there, go, baby. <laughs> there is an interesting, just a technical question about rhythm. Now, hey, uh, the um, fun of finding out who you are is to find out uh, what your hedonic uh, diagnostic structure is. And these things do go in rhythms. Uh, uh, it's like anything else in life, there are ups and downs. And the particular timing of your rhythms and the height uh, and the depths and so forth, uh, that's the, uh, the name of the game. Now, there are some... Uh, 
people who say that you can get to level one, which is just the pure void ocean of bliss and stay there all the time. Um, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's certainly uh, worth finding out. <laughs> I do feel, though, that uh, we should be as precise and as conscious as we can of which particular path or yoga uh, each of us should take. And we should be very gentle with each other, recognizing that uh, we uh, are at different karmic stages and levels and uh, we're going in different directions at the same time, and uh, we mustn't get in each other's way. Uh, I think we all get the guru that we deserve. We all get the God we deserve. Now, um, if some people settle for a level five God. That's conditioned uh, reward and punishment. Some people like a level six God, wrathful all the time, <laughs> when he's not scared. <laughs> um, I have suggested, though, that there are two general directions or branches or perhaps... Uh, Perhaps uh, we can only take one of these in a lifetime, or perhaps there's a rhythm that we can try one and then the other. But there are two different directions, and one is to turn on your body. That's the tantric. And the other is to uh, turn off your body and try to get higher and higher. Now, the turn-off school says, yes, so we recognize that you, there are the senses, and we recognize that there's the mind, and we recognize that there are the emotions, and that there's the body and the delicious chakras, and you can have all these exquisite sexual and circulatory things, but you've got to um, center all these in, and turn them off and turn them off and turn them off until you get the kundalini and everything getting up here, and then you, uh, you just stay up in, this, in the uh, electric flash void uh, nirvana state. Um, turn on the body or turn off the body. <laughs> now, the first, uh, the turn on the body yoga or direction uh, clearly requires uh, the male-female unit. This is uh, the spiritual marriage, which I'm going to be talking about tonight. Now, the other method, you're trying to detach. You're trying to detach any attachments from out there and desires so that it becomes the auto-erotic. Uh, and of course, the more you think about this, uh, we're talking about two manifestations of God. Uh, God as a male, or God as a female. Now, it's very likely that a third or a quarter or a half of this audience is, is uh, never going to get married. Oh, you may make a social contract, but uh, you're, never, you're just not made to be married. And that your yoga is perhaps not to uh, take psychedelic drugs more than once, perhaps, just to see what they can do. Uh, now, there may be well, good reasons for this. The DNA may know what it's doing. The DNA uh, may, uh, you know, does this in other species, uh, in a species of uh, like equines or uh, in many mammal species. Uh, not all males um, pass on the DNA code. In some uh, tribes and troops of uh, primates, there's only one male that does it. So that uh, there's a tremendous range here. It's not just either or, but uh, we are dealing here with central issues uh, that will determine the success, uh, your acceleration of your spiritual progress. Now, um, if I suggest that there is maybe half of this audience that uh, probably karmically shouldn't make a full-time yoga of sight on drugs, or of a spiritual marriage. I'm not putting you down, nor do I want you to put us down. Uh, it's just, uh, I would say, as a matter of fact, if I had to say, which was the higher evolutionary form, I would say, turn off yoga. Learn how to turn off your body and get into electric or magnetic or uh, uh, laser type uh, 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 communication. And uh, that probably is, uh, well, evolution works on a helix anyway, so that what's down now is up later. Um, it's very likely that many of you in this audience should follow someone like Meher Baba or uh, Maharishi, or should go back to a more orthodox form of Protestantism or Christianity or Catholicism. It may well be that we're predestined uh, to 
to uh, favor one of these yogas or another. You know, Calvin, everyone puts John Calvin and those early Swiss uh, hard-headed Protestants down. They talked about predestination, and they laid it right out. They said, some people are going to make it to heaven and some aren't. Uh, well, there's a little truth in that, not in the pessimistic, static nature. I, I consider Calvinism to be static Hinduism. For those of you who are theologically inclined, um, it's static because uh, there's no question of failure. But I do think that how we do it may be predestined uh, by our genetic type. And again, there's no, uh, <laughs> there's no one-upmanship here. We're all going to meet eventually in that central solar place, you know, the soul bank where it's all vibrating and bright and you know the sound that it makes and there's nothing, no bodies, no life in the DNA code. It's just that hum uh, and uh, you, we'll all meet there. And the next time we meet there, after we spend eternities and eternities there, we may spin out as electrons again. And the next time around, uh, some of you may have to play the um, role of the self-appointed, uh, <laughs> self-chosen high priest of LSD. Sick. <laughs> yeah, which uh, aim to serve you right. <laughs> And maybe next time around, I'll get to be naked in a cave in India, not talking for 30 years with an orgasm, constant orgasm grin on my face. <laughs> now, uh, my aspiration at the moment is to be something like a celestial psychologist. <laughs> I, want to, I want to help each and every one of you <laughs> to understand a little bit more about your your uh, spiritual profile or your karmic uh, uh, direction and then check it out uh, and uh, uh, see where it takes you. Now, you see, it's a drag if we don't know uh, what, what the DNA code that designed us for. It really becomes a drag. I know at Millbrook, uh, there, there were a lot of people that came there that just weren't supposed to be on the turn on the body uh, tantric mating trip. And it was a drag for them because we would be sitting around uh, doing our thing and they would be there restless and rebellious and feeling not right or feeling wrong when they should have been getting their kicks passing out leaflets at the door. <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> it's, uh, because we just shouldn't be getting in each other's way um, <coughs> on this great trip. Now, um, I've said that the, uh, the, the, two, the, the two basic yogas are you do it by yourself or you do it with your shakti or a member of the opposite sex. Now, um, see, if you're going to do it by yourself, the rules is you have to cut off attachments, cut off attachments, cut off sensory, yeah, cut off somatic, yeah, cut off game attachments, more and more and more. The, the, uh, the basic uh, formula or the basic yantra or design of the do-it-yourself trip, I think, uh, and I uh, thank uh, Michael Green for this uh, particular formulation, it's Lazar. You know, when, when Mayor, Mayor Baba says, or uh, Ramakrishna says, or Maharishi says, uh, uh, all you have to do all you have to do is believe in me, because I'm God. Get my rhythm. All you have to do is just get my rhythm. Yeah, I love you better than you love yourself. You just got to believe in me, and if you believe in me, if you really do, and turn off everything else and believe in me, and get my rhythm, you get it? Just get my rhythm. Yeah, come on, get my, yeah. If you just love me and love me and love me. Uh, do you know how the laser works? an aquarium trip. <laughs> the, the principle of the laser is that you get the, the, the 
all in the same frequency. And the, when they add, they don't just don't add, uh, you get um, a multiple so that uh, if you get uh, everything vibrating the same way, um, uh, tremendous energy is expelled. Uh, so you have to, if you're on the do-it-yourself trip, of course you can't do it yourself because you're just struggling from level five up, you have to find a beat, you have to find a rhythm, you have to surrender yourself to some, uh, to some uh, uh, vibration that you believe in and know as God. And you've got to love it and surrender to it completely. And um, uh, see, if Mayor Baba could have done that, or if uh, Ra uh, Maharishi could have done that, they, they knew exactly what the astrophysics of the game is. If they could get a uh, hundred million people saying Om at the same time, Hare Krishna, they know that they get enough people and that uh, a laser beam would uh, develop that would really uh, um, you know, destroy ignorance and so forth. The, the physics of it, uh, oh, it was obvious to Taita Shadan, to many uh, Eastern and Western uh, thinkers, but that's the, the uh, aim of the do-it-yourself trip. That is, you, uh, you know, you have to pick out that basic vibration, and um, um, if you're going to do it yourself, that is, if you're going, if you're not going to take a body tantra mating spiritual marriage trip, it, you, know, you can just stay down and play games down here. But if you really want to, to make a, a lifelong uh, voyage of discovery, and if you're going to do it yourself, then you've got to start detaching from all externals, because if anything that's obvious from studying of of ecclesiastical history. If they're a do-it-yourself religion, that is a, a get your vibration with somebody else's religion, get your vibration with God religion, that sort of religion that starts stirring up energy, if, if, it, if you don't just keep pure, you keep listening to Mayor Baba, yeah, just keep listening to him, just don't do anything else but keep listening to him. If you get distracted down here, then um, it's faggot. Do you follow? Uh -huh. You're getting energies building up, building up, which are not uh, being transmitted to the biological unit that it's made for. Uh, and uh, you have electrons and neutrons stirring up a lot of heat uh, with no relationship to the proton. Now, as I've suggested in my last comment, the model of the tantric, uh, the second... Uh, spiritual form we're talking about is um, well, it's at the level of, um, of the body, it's the DNA code. Here's the thing about the DNA code, see, it's embracing, uh, right? It's embracing. And the DNA code, uh, to create life, it just can't go out like that. It's, uh, it's, uh, I'll talk more about jealousy in a minute. Uh, uh, the DNA trip is an exclusive trip because it makes a difference between what we're doing here in this life form and uh, the uh, amino acids out there that we may use or not. Um, 